and two is just three times of time. So first of all, uh, please start players. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first I wanted to, to thank Wing Ching for this invitation and for all the hard work that uh, he and, and all of these people here have done in, in organizing the conference. And uh, it's been great so far, and it continues to be a source of inspiration uh, for me. Uh, I also wanted to, to pay homage to, to Neil Smith. Um, as I said yesterday, uh, urban de uh, uneven development was sort of the linchpin for my, for my master's thesis. Uh, he was also responsible for my first uh, publication 20 years ago, um, and, uh, um, and also responsible for my first job, um, because um, he, he really played a, a major role as a, as a mentor for me uh, early in, in my career, even though I wasn't one of his students. And it was that generosity of spirit and solidarity with, with people who uh, uh, worked in the same vain intellectually uh, that I that I really appreciated about him uh, and he's he's missed um, <clears throat> all right uh, this is my my I don't know if it's my best picture ever but this I have to point out this is a picture of a, uh, a Chinese housing development in in Lusaka since we're here in, in Hong Kong um, all right <clears throat> urban studies as a field is on the rise in Africa Environmental studies is a mainstay of scholarship about the continent. And urban environments are increasingly central to urban studies as a field. Yet, it's rare to find works which offer explicitly environmental analyses of more than one urban issue or urban analyses of environmental issues in more than one city in Africa. The few broader analyses of urban environments come in dry policy documents or superficial observations from Western journalists. So what are we going to do about this? There's been some debate in African urban studies over the question of the clash of rationalities in the planning dynamics of the continent's cities, where rational Western planning mindsets clash with the vision of ordinary um, urban majorities in poor informal settlements. This conceptualization of the clash of rationalities, I think, might be easily extended into urban environmental studies. There is a clash between the visions of the environment in planning documents or Western scholarship and in the voices of Africa's urban majorities. And yet, all manner of variety of perspectives also appear in between. For a simple example, consider the question of urban Africa's solid waste management. It's typically seen as disastrous across the continent from the Western rational planning side of things. But urban Africans often see waste issues far differently from planners and scholars. In a 2003 focus group discussion, for example, the president of an informal scavengers union in this place that is in this picture, uh, which is in Berbis uh, in, in Dakar, made a pun with the French word for waste, or dieu breaking it in two to note the French words for gold, or, and solid, or hard, dur. Waste, he said, is solid gold. Yet waste is solid misery for other urban Africans who may protest the decrepit state of sanitation and waste services in their neighborhoods. Or they may have too many other concerns weighing them down to bother with any protest over waste issues. So one way to break the apparent impasse between Western modernist planning perspectives and ordinary people's views would be to force feed outside lenses onto the continent to make the trends in Western studies fit African contexts. Another would be to fall back on the rather tired pattern of concluding that African cities don't work or aren't cities in the right way. One also might simply champion the urban poor majority's view of African environments as a part of what Sarah Nuttall and Ashil Mbembe have termed Afropolitan urbanism. To me, other possibilities pre present themselves, which can articulate a broader set of African views of urban environments. And these have yet to be explored to any great extent. 
So my arguments here fit uh, more broadly with the global discussion of recentering urban studies that a lot of uh, people here will be quite familiar with. I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but uh, this critique has energized a reconsideration of the, the, the need to, to construct uh, global hierarchies of cities and the desirability of building from, from uh, Western theory. Um, the regional implications of this shift also connect up well um, with the broader efforts in African studies beyond urban analysis, the aims of which I think are pretty well captured in the title of a recent book, uh, Reclaiming the Human Sciences and Humanities Through African Perspectives. One of the key steps in that reclaiming, uh, as Olakushi and Yamjo put it, is to be more effectively involving not only African scholars, but also local experts and communities in the research design and implementation with the aim of increased endogeneity in knowledge production and dissemination. In attempting to do so, though, we come to the question of building a conceptual framework which could allow for this sort of reclaiming. One scholarly realm that might lend opportunities for that sort of reclaiming uh, is urban political ecology. And just to be short, since I only have 30 minutes, I'm going to say UPE. I know that's annoying, but it just makes it shorter. Political ecologists seek to understand environmental change in political, historical, cultural, and economic terms, as well as ecological, and to see causal factors that in that change at multiple scales. The literature, the literature of explicitly urban political ecology, though, emerged largely outside of Africa, and particularly in reference to the West cities. Scholars have yet to build much dialogue, which kind of shocks me, uh, between approaches found in, in this UPE uh, with the critical analyses of Africa-based political ecology that's focused around what are typically conceived as rural environmental issues, like deforestation or wildlife conservation. And although there are some exceptions, most of the UPE scholarship in Africa has used South African cities as the empirical base. So I'm working to kind of expand the geographical uh, bases of operation and establish stronger links uh, with the, the longer tradition of, of rural uh, political ecology. UPE uh, seeks, in the words of Alex Loftus, to disrupt the idea of the city as the antithesis of nature building on Marxist urban theory to see cities as socio-natural ecosystems produced in the power relationships of capitalism. UPE's historical materialist roots are much more evident than those of rural political ecology in Africa. UPE, which builds specifically from African theoretical bases or which centers on environmental justice, is very rare. African voices of UPE are nearly unheard. Exceptions exist in moderately expanding number, but the small volume of UPE in urban Africa is made particularly striking by the evident potential for scholarly work which examines urban environments and environmental justice from a variety of perspectives that build from African voices. It's difficult to make broad generalizations across a region comprising more than 50 countries and more than 50 cities which have more than a million people. But I believe that some of this thinness has to do with the alien and alienating starting places of Western UPE as it travels to Africa. As my uh, former student Mary Lahan and, and Henrik Ernst and John Silver put it, UPE's conceptual emphases do not sufficiently allow for the many forms of power and urban experiences that shape cities and socioecologies in African settings. For one example from UPE's conceptual wheelhouse that many of you may be familiar with, water infrastructure networks. Well, they don't provide the flows literally of water or figuratively of power in cities of the region in the same manner as they do in Western cities. Many pipes do not have water flowing in them, and many areas off the grid are more likely to have the best and cheapest water. Western-oriented UPE's stronger political economy orientation. Similarly, it does not always fit neatly into African urban contexts. Since a lot of the urban economy is informal and without large-scale manufacturing, class structures are often very unclear. Multiple sources of socio-cultural identity transcend class. Urban neoliberalism takes on very different meanings in urban Africa. Having worked hard to do so in my own work, as Don knows, as the series editor of the book it's published in, 
it's now clear to me that a critique of urban neoliberalism as the linchpin around which to build research on urban environmental governance on the continent is problematic. Given those challenges, it might be encouraging that UPE starts turning to post-structuralism and to look at non-Western settings. Uh, Roger Kyle recently highlighted among what he calls the frontiers of UPE, the importance of further research on all manner of peripheral urbanization, such as the squatter settlements of the global south at the urban fringe, as what he calls the new reality in which strategies of sustainability are being negotiated. But global south researchers, even beyond Africa, struggle with the applicability of UPE's post-structuralist turn. African conceptualizations of nature-society relations rarely seem to leave room for the same sort of valuing of non-human agency one finds in post-structuralist UPE. Companion species relationships, or pets, are remarkably different in many cities in Africa than in Western cities. I have my doubts about whether Eric Swingedal's adaptation of Donna Haraway's metaphor of the cyborg, which is quite famous in UPE, into the notion of cyborg urbanization that results in, this is Swingedal's quote, in a socio-natural network combining circulations and metabolisms of human and non-human, leaves room for contemplating the widely prevalent spiritual and supernatural consciousness of urban space in Africa. I'm reminded of this overfilled trash slab in Zanzibar, from which municipal trash workers were reluctant to remove the trash because the slab was a local portal to the Swahili underworld, Giningi. And they had confirmation of this for me in the form of evil spirits disguised as Indian house crows eating at the trash slab. Cyborg just doesn't suffice as a means for interpreting that intersection of human and non-human metabolisms. There might be room for some sort of post-structuralist thinking in an Africa-centered UPE, but, conceptual, but complexities like that abound. In his book, Everyday Environmentalism, Creating an Urban Political Ecology, Loftus offers a tantalizing array of potential building blocks for a new UPE that might account for African urban realities. The everyday life of South Africa's urban poor serves as his inspiration for seeking out new ways of thinking. And the book has a careful, close reading of both, both the Western literature of UPE and a slew of radical urban theorists for their attention to the environment or their lack thereof. He builds chapters in the book around the works of Harvey, Neil Smith, George Lukash, Gramsci, Lefebvre. These are all my favorites. And as that list may suggest, the book lands frustratingly far from an appreciation of the diverse and complex readings of urban environments which would emerge from African urban voices. One loses track of what the everyday means in the book's dense thicket of abstract, non-African radical philosophy. Only in the 17 pages, and I counted, which deal with a portion of the city of Durban, Inamba, Inanda, where Loftus is more directly concerned with how the radical idea of subaltern peoples comes to cohere uh, within and between specific historical and geographical contexts, do we read much of anything about what urban Africans think, feel, or do about the environment of their city? Even here, though, I'm less sanguine than Loftus about the oppositional potential or radical univocality of the urban poor even the power relationships within apartheid-era townships were much more complicated and fractured than class analysis can express. To say nothing of how much more fractious and complex these have become in post-apartheid South Africa, or of how vastly different urban South African race and class dynamics are from those of cities virtually anywhere else in Africa. We need a messier theoretical lens. To some extent, Loftus wants that messier theoretical lens. He introduces some post-structuralist and feminist ideas into straight-up Marxist thought in several chapters. But we still barely hear from Ananda's people, and certainly not from a broad cross-section. In Ananda, as in many similar townships or informal settlements in Africa, it is rarely possible 
to categorize and simplify historical blocks of society into neat packages ready to be revolutionized. The realities of everyday environmentalism in urban Africa are myriad and varied. The complexities of what uh, is often referred to in African studies as South African exceptionalism, exceptionalism are evident and relevant here as well. And I'm going to skip over that because I really don't uh, I want to stay on time as we had such struggles with time uh, yesterday and a very long day. Uh, but I just note that South Africa is the earliest and largest center for urban environmental justice discussions, debate, and action in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, some of the reasons why that occurred have to do with how easily or supposedly easily the, the slippage was to connect uh, with uh, the, the birthplace of environmental justice discussions in the American South with its uh, similar or parallel uh, race relations. Uh, but there are a lot of settings that mark South Africa out uh, as a place that may not be so applicable uh, to the rest of the continent. And the, the, the three that I, I pick on here are that first, the constitution, environmental laws, and deliber deliberative processes, at least on paper, place it well ahead of the rest of Africa in questions of uh, environmental justice. Secondly, post-apartheid South Africa adopted neoliberal sustainable urban development policies of its own volition and not under uh, the same conditions of debt and donor dependency that prevailed across most of the continent. Uh, and third, it's worth noting that South Africa has a substantial critical left scholarly community to critique sustainable development policy and environmental justice rhetoric. And their scholarship still has potential for significant policy impacts. This is very different than the situation in most of Africa. So my argument is that if we're going to build UPE and movements for socio-environmental justice from African perspectives, we need to begin from somewhere other than Western theorists and somewhere other than South Africa. Yet perhaps perversely, uh, I'll admit, uh, this is where the, the long and deep bench of more rurally based political ecology research may offer a way forward uh, in its substantial commitment to the multivocality of the everyday environmental consciousness of the continent's ordinary people. Uh, and I developed this uh, idea from, from Pierce Blakey from a long time ago, uh, talking about an interactionist approach to environmental problems, um, where <clears throat> There's not an objective reality, but many subjective ones, which are provided by different people who see their real landscape in their own ways. And we see this kind of uh, approach in, in work across Africa from Rick Schrader, from Don Moore, from Tom Bassett, um, many scholars. These are just the three that, that I know well um, as, a, as a, a sample of this sort of critical progressive eye uh, that is there to the historical uh, and cultural dimensions of landscape change in the sort of classic uh, political ecology fashion. There's much to be gained, I believe, from adapting this kind of an interactionist framework along uh, their lines for reading urban environments in Africa. And this leads me to propose five possible starting places. I'm going to go back to my last slide here. <clears throat> for rereading African urban environments. In the book to which this paper belongs, there are uh, these five that I've named here, the readings of the experts, readings of the past, uh, readings of the artists, readings of the cityscapes, and readings of the grassroots. Uh, I'm going to talk just about the one today uh, because I think it's the most relevant to the questions of, of the workshop, uh, and that is about um, the... You know, I went back the wrong way the multivocality uh, at the grassroots. Any effort to build UPE or urban environmental justice movements from the grassroots and cities of Africa would probably begin not with spatial discourse or with the novelists, intellectuals, or policy makers of my other readings, but from those who give voice to the lack of representation of informal settlements, from much more forthrightly articulating the voices of ordinary people. I'm going to take a look at Pekin, which is a satellite city just outside of Dakar, and then also talk about uh, peri-urban settlements in, in Tanzania. 
many people are not very familiar with Bikin here, I'm sure. It'll take a very brief introduction. Uh, it grew from a rural area uh, with less than 8,000 people in 1952 to a city of 1.2 million as of 2012. Bikin residents confront a staggering array of environmental problems on a daily basis, to say nothing of poverty, extreme overcrowding, crime, violence, or social unrest. The farthest rural edge in Pekin is home to Berbis, the, the Trash Mountain. Uh, the urban heart of Pekin experiences chronic, severe seasonal flooding, which leads to lakes of standing water that in turn generate a cascade of human and environmental health calamities. One encounters few waste or sanitation services in Pekin. Much of any effort of confronting urban environmental crises, despite some political environmental <laughs> mobilization in the last political election, political campaign, happens not from the government, but from the actions of local initiatives. And yet even this proves elusive. As Abraman Diallo said in an interview, normally initiatives would come from the people, but not necessarily in Pekin. At the same time, it's unimaginable to have political environmental action in Pekin that creates meaningful change without networks that arise from this not necessarily circumstance. In Diallo's words, in Pekin, you have to be connected. You have to have, you have to have relations. Your capital should be in people, not money. If you don't have people, you have nothing. This is where the solidarity works. By contrast, as al Hazaji Jo, also from Pekin, put it, the government basically doesn't give a damn about what happens here. Berbis has that union of informal scavengers, Pekin as a whole, as an association of informal sector workers. Uh, and they also have a strong contingent of what is called Yanama, uh, which is a movement that translates as, we are sick of it. Uh, they were the folks who really brought uh, Senegal's, its, its latest president. Uh, and, and rappers and hip hop artists who collaborate in the expression of not just how sick of it Pekinwa are, but of how to work together to change it. But they do not necessarily succeed, either in the working together or in the changing of their environments. In Berbis, we have the president of the scavengers union making the, the pun. But he also said, this is why the government wants to close the trash mountain, to control its solid gold, instead of leaving it for people to him, like him, to survive on. The rapper, Matador, said to me, if you think people from the US or Europe are going to get you a job or the government is going to provide for you, think again. You have to struggle. Build things for yourself. These sorts of sentiments lead to the efforts of Pequinois to self-organize, particularly to confront flooding crises. The very formation of organizations is a challenge, though, particularly for women's groups. As Jian Yang said in a January 2013 focus group of women leaders, Women have a real problem to express themselves in this society. Our husbands don't want us to join women's groups because they fear being replaced and losing power over us. But she said some members of her women's group lost their sons in that flood water. And that spurred them to at least attempt to organize for action. Nonetheless, we saw in our focus group with women leaders held at an NGO resource center that the two men who ran that center, attempted to redirect the women's comments and even to dictate the terms of their discussion of the Pekin environment. So if we're going to have a UPE that arises from African voices, it has to be built from outside the loop of the usual suspects. And it has to take seriously the multiple, sometimes contradictory perspectives of environmentalisms of the poor, on par from the beginning with the intellectuals the radical potential, the level of both political and environmental consciousness, and the techno-savvy of, of the grassroots in places like Pekin are actually quite hard to read. Voices do not sing in unison from the grassroots about the urban environments of the continent. I argue for the importance of, but also the multivocality of, everyday populist understandings of African urban environments and visions of socio-environmental justice and rights to the city. I'm not going to go through the Tanzanian example because I'm running out of time. Um, but my question here is why do you have 
uh, so little outside of South Africa of the movements for urban environmental justice in sub-Saharan Africa. And I have a lot of different answers for this, but um, some of the things that I argue in the, in the Tanzanian case have to do with uh, the government's strong hand over many years in controlling uh, civil society. Uh, these uh, NGOs and environmental groups are a very recent phenomenon in Tanzania. Um, and as this sort of sustainable urban development <coughs> lingo has taken hold in, in, in Tanzania kind of in a donor-driven uh, way, and these stakeholder-driven meetings come to, to exist. Who are those stakeholders? They're very rarely going to be uh, leaders of a, a women's environmental NGO. Um, I have records that show how overwhelmingly government voices are the stakeholders in these stakeholder sessions that are supposedly about participatory development. Is that my time, Bill? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, my, my last section is, is dealing with, with uh, how to work for, for justice, rights, and, and voice. Um, uh, this actually comes from Lusaka. I was going to be talking about uh, Lusaka. This uh, Lil Wayne uh, comes up in, in, a, in, a, in a slum in, in Lusaka. And my, my questions there are really uh, aimed at, at, at looking at, at Harvey and the inspiration that comes from, from Harvey in, in social justice in the city, but saying, you know, when you look at the, the, the program of radical political action that has really defined Harvey's uh, uh, work for many years in contemporary urban Africa, there's a, there's a lot of, of challenges that come uh, in, in applying this, uh, particularly because this whole notion of radical political action on the continent is often associated with uh, those governments uh, that claim to have uh, Marxist or socialist uh, roots that, that actually cut off the grassroots and starve and poison them. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to say that I, I, I feel that the, the potential exists in this sort of outpouring of, of urban studies in Africa recently to turn towards uh, environmental issues, to bring the, the, the fields together of urban environmental studies. Uh, to do so, there needs to be a kind of re reorientation, rethinking of, of what the environment means, what environmental justice means uh, in African urban context. And, and if we're going to use the lens of urban political ecology, then it needs to be paying uh, much greater attention uh, to uh, the ways in which um, African voices transform uh, the, the discussion from the, from the grassroots up. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, around 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Thanks, Garth. That's an interesting presentation. Um, I wonder two things. One is, um, I feel like it's important to like draw into the equation the pretty radical resistance to oil exploitation that's happened across the continent sure. and, and is actually increasing in both its kind of intensity and and resistance especially thinking of yeah like across west africa yeah. even in madagascar where tar sands exploitation is starting to happen and i think those movements actually like grounding in those movements as a starting place is something that often sort of gets skittled over somehow yeah. it's as though like you know it's actually some of it is armed resistance even you yeah. know to like really driving out companies and um, as well as the movements, for example, in Somalia, of, like the pirates that are, like many locals that have seen as defending the coast against right. um, also tanker traffic on that side of the continent. So I think like, and I think that's the thing in the scholarship often we almost, it's like that's happening yeah. in one area and then it's like, where's the literature, you know? Right. And I just think that there's something really to be said about that. And I saw also on your presentation that you had something about like artists' accounts. And I think that's also an important, like, yeah. you know, to think about the city as also something that's being described through the telling of stories and, and you know, like telling of, the, of literature, yeah. actually, like yeah. books like Wings of Dying, you know, that talk about the process of mourning and like how that relates to the city or yeah. the exploded view, you know, that's like, that's a Johannesburg based book, but that's still like kind of 
takes in the city as, you know, I think that those are more like possibly poignant resources for thinking about um, how the, the city is viewed in the continent than even like Asha Mambe's work that so to me like speaks kind of of a language of theory that sort of, um, but I also wanted, um, I just thought it's also the, the difference between like um, the people and like capital P and the small P people and I think it's often a problem that actually comes from like the developmentalist views on Africa. It's like who is the people that we're supposed to talk to that holds the like magic wand of truth, you know, about the the um, shack settlement or like what's happening in the city. Like I think that there's something really um, tricky about the valuing of uh, of voices and sometimes overvaluing, um, you know, the voices of the poor, the World Bank kind of framework which is also then also taken up by the left is. So I just wondered if like how you would contend it a little bit. I know that's just actually a comment as much as a yeah. question, but yeah. maybe. Sure, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, and in the, uh, I haven't written this book yet, by the way, but um, in, the, in the rest of it, I do deal with, with uh, the, the Niger Delta um, and, and also with literature uh, quite extensively. Uh, those sections I actually have written. Um, and um, in my last book, I actually talked a whole chapter about Mogadishu and about uh, piracy, and, and it's all based around uh, Nordin Farah. Um, and, and I do think that, that, that the artists, uh, novelists, but also artists, are absolutely crucial to, to kind of getting at uh, a voice uh, that is quite important uh, among the people with the little p. Um, I also think, though, that when you look at a situation like, like the Niger Delta, although on the one hand, it brings out uh, the, the problematic uh, false boundary zone between rural and urban, um, it's mostly quote unquote rural sort of dilemma, um, but it's all intimately connected with every city uh, in the world through oil and also with all, all the urban growth in, in, in Nigeria, especially in Lagos. Um, but it also brings out some of the problems that I was talking about in terms of, of how you address uh, the people and who is speaking for whom. Because as, a, as a, an armed movement, MEND has splintered into many different groups. Uh, there is, a, similarly to the situation in, in uh, Somalia, the, there, there are pirates that are just pirates. And, and there are people who have a, a strong environmental movement. Um, in, the, in the paper, in the uh, Dakar section, I talk about uh, this in relation to fishing rights uh, in Dakar, where there is the same kind of uh, multivocality uh, going on. Um, and I guess the uh, last thing I'd say about this is that part of what I'm, I, I, I harped on the, the problems of, of a kind of leftist reading of, of urban political ecology. But the, the deeper problem, or the greater problem, really, for the practicalities of, of everyday environmentalism in Africa is the kind of thing that we were talking about yesterday, of this, this co-optation that Solomon was, was discussing, of, uh, of the kind of critical voice uh, in development. And nowhere is that better expressed uh, in, in the African urban context than in the, the efforts of the World Bank Cities Alliance to produce, uh, using the African Center for Cities as its launching pad, uh, to produce uh, state of the cities reports for all of the countries on the continent. Uh, and part of the terms of this was that uh, in gathering data, since there's such a lack of a lot of data on, on informal settlements, gathering data in different cities across the continent, um, the powers that be in each country in developing the State of the Cities Report would have to rely on a civil society partner. In every country, that had to be Slum Dwellers International, which only existed in South Africa at that point. It's now spread all across the continent. But you sign on to have them do the surveys in Kibera, to have them do the surveys in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and Accra, when they just showed up yesterday. And you have groups that do exist. They're not necessarily environmental groups. They're not necessarily uh, trained in doing surveys. But you have groups that have existed in Kibera or Mathari in Nairobi for 30 years that were bypassed. 
that are civil society groups. So you can really see that, that at work. And that's really more problematic than, than Alex Loftus, who's a really nice guy. <laughs> I have two questions that might be related. And one begins, I guess, with Alex Loftus. And at the very end of your talk, you came back to David Harvey, yeah. right? Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about how you understand the articulation between um, you know, kind of theory from the African perspective, right, and theory from outside? And uh, secondly, um, given what you've been talking about, how do you understand larger global forces intersecting with what you're talking about? It can range from you know, the long-standing redlining of, of Africa by Western capital, yeah. right? The mass um, influence of Chinese uh, capital yeah. in Africa now, and so forth, which you may not be able to get a handle on by talking with folks in the uh, informal settlements that you are, yeah. you know, that you're working with, and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. I'll go to that that second point first. Um, I think that um, the, the the global forces. Are, are they're crucial to understanding the dynamic, and they are often um, limited in terms of, of uh, the, the consciousness over them in a lot of discussions with people in these uh, interviews and focus groups I've had in, in over the years in different um, informal settlements. Um, but um, my contention would be, I guess, kind of following Peter Taylor that that. There's still in the, the you know long live the nation state it still exists and there's there's a, a role the nation state plays in in policing and um, and mediating uh, those global forces uh, so for instance in Tanzania uh, when you talk to people about development problems um, they will consistently blame the government and blame Ujama especially in Zanzibar. They will talk ad nauseum about what they call the, the Catholic conversion movement, um, which is the CCM Chama Chama Pinduzi, the Revolutionary Party, uh, and um, never really address how that government's policies were shaped by the IMF. <coughs> and so its turn to neoliberalism was not something that, in fact, Julius Nyerere fought bitterly over. He resigned rather than enforced. Um, so there's something of a, of a continuation, I think, of that, of that role of kind of the, the screen that kind of guards people from seeing uh, the broader perspective, the, the broader global forces. And I think Harvey, Harvey really addresses that very well, uh, the sort of redlining of Africa. I think that's actually the word he uses. Um, <clears throat> I would say uh, the understanding I have is of the, the, the intersection of African voices um, with, with radical theory um, is that first and foremost, I think we need to avoid taking uh, the ideas that come straight out of, of our reading of Gramsci and plopping them onto the situation in Inanda or in um, Kibera um, because the that's not to say that they're not, they're not relevant or that they don't have anything to say to the situation. But uh, I think there's a, there's a, a role for, for being quiet. I've spent my career trying to listen to understand what people are, are saying to me. And sometimes I miss it and come back years later to, to an interview and realize, oh, it really wasn't. You know, I remember this one particular case uh, where I had to do a revision on an article. Uh, and I went back to an interview that I had um, with a, a woman in, in, in Zanzibar in my dissertation. This was at least 10 years afterwards. And I kind of been posing the, the situation as landlords versus tenants. And the landlords were Arab and Indian. And the tenants were African. Um, and there was this one phrase that I had completely elided in my dissertation and in, in my reference to that passage in the, um, in the article where the woman said, we had, she was a tenant, and she said, with the landlords, we had the usual sorts of human relationships. It wasn't like we didn't uh, ever get along. And, and she gave examples of Indian philanthropy in, in helping people in a flood and all these things that you know, sort of belied the fact that there was this very real relationship. Um, 
And so coming at the dissertation as a, as a good you know, student of, of, of Gramsci, uh, I was seeing you know, the, the, the things that, that brought the solidarity, that brought the revolution to Zanzibar, and not seeing, you know, well, actually, there were human relationships going on, and we got along sometimes. And Indians are just people like we are, and things that I didn't see. And I, so I think that's, that was a lesson to me to, to kind of always be thinking where do these two intersect? Thank you very much. I feel we uh, run out of time now. Uh, so thank you very much for a very interesting presentation.